Hello, everybody. Welcome to join the Shy of Miners webinar brought to you by Kananga and uh, supported by Wealthfort. Uh, my name is Shen Chu. I'm the moderator for today's uh, webinar. Now, before we uh, proceed, I just want to check if everything is doing okay. If you can see our webcam, see my slide and hear my voice clearly, please type yes in the questions and chat box okay let me know if you can hear me clearly all right cool yeah long time didn't see you all all right yes we're months since we do this uh, webinar with Kananga yes all right thank you everybody for uh, tuning in for today's uh, Kananga's uh, webinar now as uh, many of you know the Federal Reserve of the United States have embarked on uh, unlimited quantitative easing. That means that they can print money at a horrendous speed and uh, without any upside limit. So will this means that we will bring more demand for uh, gold and silver as a precious metal so that uh, we'll our speaker will address it tonight and today we will also look at beside gold and silver as a precious metal can we invest in the miners okay that's why today we talk about mining industry so we have invited a very uh renowned speaker on this he's a subject matter expert on the mining industry and uh, today he will share with you his view about how to invest in the mining sector okay so disclaimer for this webinar brought to you by Kananga is that whatever we share in this webinar is only for case study purpose in no way that will give you any buy or sell call to any stock so if you decide to buy or sell you do it uh, at your own risk okay you're 100% responsible for your financial decisions so in the Q3 Kananga has uh, uh, brought to you these following topics for the Q3 webinars in uh, next month in July on the 3rd of July we'll be talking about 2020 uh, uh, next half of the outlook for 2020, it will be done in the Mandarin session because we understand that uh, uh, some of the clients also want to listen to it in the uh, Mandarin. So we prepare a Mandarin session for you. In the August, we will talk about making friends with the trend and uh, then followed by another topic by uh, Derek Tan. Then in September, we have two more sessions by Yu Kok Hua and uh, Ian Tai. Okay, so this is the Kananga Cantrip webinar for the quarter three of 2020. So please mark your calendars for all this date, okay, so that you can uh, you know, be educated and be an informed investor through the contents brought to you by Kananga. Now, allow me to introduce our speaker today. He is a full-time investor, author, and a trainer. He has more than 20 years of investing experience in Bursa and uh, 11 years of investing experience in the foreign markets such as the Hong Kong Exchange, SGX, Singapore Exchange, you know, NASDAQ, uh, New York Stock Exchange, ASX, Australian Stock Exchange, as well as uh, London Stock Exchange. He is a best-selling author of Invest in Foreign Shares and Invest in REITs and uh, recently he also launched his uh, third book called The Global Economic Collapse. So his area of expertise includes financial analysis in broad sectors in the resource industry and REITs. So you can ask him anything about resource industry. I believe he will be able to answer you, uh, not only in the precious matter, but also in other uh, resource industry. Now he has seven years of experience teaching retail investors in local stock as well as global stock. And academy-wise, he graduated from uh, NUS in uh, 1989. Okay, so he is none other than PC Wong. So over to you, PC. Let me make you a presenter now. All right. So I've given you the presenter control, PC. Yeah. Okay. A uh, very good evening. Uh, thank you to all those who are tuning in. So let's look at today's content outline. Uh, we'll be looking at why. Uh, invest in gold and silver miners, understand the basic language of miners, learn what are the proven and probable reserves, learn what are measured, indicated, and inferred resources, learn what are cash costs and all in sustaining costs, understand the stages of a mining company, and what is the difference between explorer, royalty company, junior producer, and major producer. 
and then we will look at what are the ETFs for miners. Now let's look at why invest in gold and silver miners. This chart may come as a surprise to all of you all, including myself when I first looked at it last year. And if you look at it, since the year 2000, gold has outperformed, gold and silver has outperformed both the Dow index and the S&P index. You can see that gold actually have increased 528.9% and silver 249.2%, whereas the Dow over the last 20 years only increased 139.9% and the S&P 118.7%. Now, why is that? I use the year 2000 as a reference point. Because ever since the year 2000, the Federal Reserve has undertake to solve all economic crises by monetary easing policies. Okay, it started with the year, with the, in fact, a bit before the Y2K, Alan Greenspan actually was afraid that the entire economy would collapse because of the Y2K bug. So during the late 1990s, uh, around 99, 98, 99, he has started some monetary easing policy in preparation of the Y2K bug. But after that, what happened was it led to the Nasdaq bubble. And when the Nasdaq bubble burst in early, I think around 2000 to 2001, Greenspan started to slash interest rate. And that is when extreme monetary policy start, started. And what we have then is because of the cheap money, people started to invest in the stock market, invest in properties, and that led to the mortgage crisis in the year 2008 and 2009. And subsequently, what the Fed did, again, they undertake even more extreme. They started QE 1 to 3, which is why during that period, you saw the gold and silver rising very, very high in terms of percentage wise. And subsequently, as the Fed under Banaki decided to go on quantity um, set a deadline for quantity tightening and increase in interest rate, which was carried under Yellen, and then passed on to, Pow uh, to Jay Powell, we faced another crisis. And that was in, December, uh, in September 2018. And the stock market actually plunged during the last quarter of 2018. And what Jay Powell did, he then went on pulling back QT. Okay, no more QT, and he has stopped increasing interest rate. So this goes to show that on the longer trend, especially now with unlimited QE and with um, zero near zero interest rate policy all the way until 2022, the Fed will continue to pump money into the market, so much so that the Federal Reserve balance sheet of assets have now reached more than seven trillion. Now, just before just before the end of QT, they managed to reduce the balance sheet from the financial crisis high of 4.5 trillion all the way down to about 3.8 trillion. But because of 2018 and coupled with the repo crisis last year, the Fed become, uh, became more lenient, okay? And they started to start, they started another QE process last year, although they say that it was not QE but it is still the same as QE because they are buying back bonds. So what happened was, we have a stock market crash in March and then the Fed went on unlimited QE. Now moving forward, as long as the stock market faces a severe test, I think the Federal Reserve would extend interest rate for a much longer period than 2022. So much so that the market is anticipating that in the coming months, the Fed would actually go towards full Japanization of the Federal Reserve, which means their actions would mirror the Bank of Japan. And likelihood, in the coming months, the Federal Reserve would instill the long-term yield curve, which means they will suppress the 10-year Treasury yield closer to zero so that it makes it 
cheaper to borrow money. And if that fail, economists are expecting that by 2021, if nothing still works, then the Federal Reserve would likely go into negative interest rate. Although at this time, the Federal Reserve say it's out of the question. But one thing for sure, the Fed cannot be trusted, okay? In 2008, Bernanke said that the housing crisis was contained. It did not. Then when it came to Janet Yellen, she said that we will never see another economic crisis in her lifetime. So what we are seeing right now is that if whatever the Fed is doing right now is not improving the market sentiment, it will go into long-term yield curve control. And if that fails, it will be negative interest rate. And if that fails, then rest assured the Fed would be buying stocks-related ETF just like the BOJ. And by that time, the Fed balance sheet would actually escalate up into tens of trillions. Now, if that happened, the US dollar would actually tank. And when US dollar tank and with yield curve going to very low near zero, then gold and silver would rise even more. A lot of people are stating that if US dollar goes up, gold would definitely go down. That is wrong, okay? Gold is not totally inverse to the US dollar. There are times when US dollar goes up and gold also goes up. That is because gold is more related to the net yield in interest rate. For example, if the certificate of deposit right now is at zero points, uh, zero point, let's say 5%, but inflation in US is 1.8% then that is a negative net yield of 1.3%. Just like the US 10-year treasury, the current yield is now about 70 basis point, but inflation is 1.8%, which means 180 basis point. So that means that the net yield is still negative 1.1%. So that's why gold is more related towards the net yield rather than totally being inverse to the US dollar. And a lot of people always treat that if US dollar goes up, gold must come down. No, it's not true. It all depends on the yield. Although during certain period when US dollar goes up, gold may come down, but over a longer term basis, gold will always move up because it is related to the net yield rather than to the US dollar. So having said that, okay, let's look at the gold minus to gold ratio. And this tells you why you should invest in gold mining stocks because based on the current trend, it is very low in terms of gold minus to the gold ratio. And this is 2016 peak. But right now, gold is actually trading at 1,700 per ounce. But in 2016, the peak price of gold, it was only $1,380 per ounce. So what we are seeing here is a totally diverge um, totally a full divergence uh, between gold price and the miners. So by right, if gold price is increasing, miners should be outperforming 2016, but it's not because people are more concerned about chasing the uh, Dow and the S&P index and the Nasdaq index rather than looking at gold miners, which make gold miners right now very undervalued versus the price of gold if we look at the historic trend. Now, if we move back to 2011, when gold hits $1,920 per ounce, the index is actually much higher. It is near somewhere around 0 0.15. Right now, the index is actually less than 0 0.1. So that implies that if the miners do we uh, retrace back their performance to 2016, uh, sorry, to 2011, it implies a 2.3 times the present value of the minus. And if we go back to the historical mean, okay, where it is more than 0 0.15, okay, hovering around 2 to 0 0.2 to 0 0.25, and if the peak, it implies a 5.4 times present value of the minus. So that's why currently miners are very cheap relative to the gold price and therefore it provides the best opportunity to invest in gold and silver mining company. So this is the gold to silver ratio. 
This ratio is calculated based on how much an ounce of gold can buy how many ounces of silver. And presently, one ounce of gold can buy 96.6 ounces of silver. That means that silver is very undervalued versus gold because when gold and silver were rising when during the period of QE1 to QE3 in 2011, it hits a 20-year low of 31.6, which means it takes 31.6 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. And that means that based on the current ratio, silver is heavily undervalued. And should it revert back to the height of 2011, it implies that silver can actually gain three times its current value. Okay, But silver is often very heavily manipulated. And there are reasons for it. Because the world has shortage of silver. And silver is being used in the electronics industry. Everything that has to do with electronic goods have silver in it. And because of that, it is important for industrialists to see a managed price of silver. And therefore, over the years, silver has been regarded more as an industrial metal than actually a precious metal. But if you go back to the years or centuries ago, both gold and silver are actually monetary assets. So right now, it depends on whether there's a shift that, uh, for investors to go into silver and treating it as a monetary asset. And it will be because if gold price starts to go up even higher, in fact, Goldman Sachs is anticipating that gold will hit more than $2,000 per ounce over the next 12 months, then gold would actually be priced beyond the means of common people. Now, there is a saying that gold is the money of royalty, silver is the money of gentlemen, and that is the money of slaves. Okay, so that means that if, let's say, gold has been priced beyond the means of ordinary investor, rest assured, a lot of investors would actually move into silver. And one of the key things is that currently, there are less than 1% of investors who are investing in gold. During the 1980s, that figure was actually 4%. Now, if you imagine that should that less than 1% of people suddenly move up and invest into gold 2%, then you will actually see a rush into gold. And not only that, it will see a rush into the gold mining stocks as well. So looking at the high gold and silver ratio, okay, it means that the current ratio of one ounce of gold can buy 96.6 ounce of silver. A reversion to 31.6, 20 year low, implies that silver has the potential to gain exponentially versus gold. It makes silver miners ideal for speculation as silver gains momentum. However, silver miners are subject to greater volatility versus gold miners because, as I mentioned, silver is highly volatile because of also a small market and therefore easily manipulated. Silver is often found alongside with gold and other major minerals and is mined as a byproduct. Silver is but seldom exists by itself. Silver is often found as a byproduct in copper mines as well as in zinc and lead mines. So in this economic downturn over the first quarter, there were a lot of shutting down of zinc and lead and copper mines because there's no in the industrial demand is not strong. So a lot of uh, miners actually cut down their production because of the slowdown. Now, because silver is found as a byproduct, what we have is that there's a shortage of silver now in the market. In fact, Peru, which, which is the world's second largest producer, just seen its production of silver fell by a staggering 74% in April this year versus last year. So there's a shortage of silver in the market. And if you look at the silver futures, even though silver right now is trading at 1750 to 1760 per ounce, if you go into the silver bullion market, there is a premium. Most are actually selling at more than $20 per ounce because 
the futures market and the physical market is totally disconnected. And that is why even in the gold market, an ounce of American gold eagle is trading at around 2,001 to 2,500, some even up to 2,800 per ounce. And that's how disconnect the market is market is because there's a lot of manipulation by the bullion banks that manage the LBMA. Okay. The other thing is that most gold miners also produce silver. Now, why invest in miners? Miners are in the most profitable position in decades. Why? Because gold has risen in value in US dollar and has reached record level in 73 global currencies. USD has risen in value versus other emerging market currencies, thus making labor costs relatively cheap in the mines across Latin America, Africa, and Asia. So oil has fallen by almost 39%. I'm talking about Brent crude here from its peak in 2020, and oil is the highest cost contributor in mining operations accounting from 20% to 25% of the cost. A 39% fall in the price of oil can result in a 7.6% to 9.75% drop in the cost of operations. Now, this is a trifecta of events resulting in one outcome, higher profits for the miners. Let's look at the language of miners. Now, if you want to invest in miners, you must be very then we must be familiar with the language of the mining industry. So let's look at the measurement. It is often quoted as ounce per ton or gram per ton of rock. Now, sometimes the amount of metal or minerals is reflected as a percentage in the rock sample. So which means per ton of rock, they would say that how many percent of gold? And that is when you calculate the percentage times the ton of rock, and then you convert it into gram or ounce. And then you would know the reserves or resources within that strata of rock. So gram per ton is more widely used nowadays, but resource is measured in ounce. So that's even in the measurement, there's a bit of a, a disconnect here because um, the, uh, when they calculate the, uh, the, uh, the tonnage, it's always gram per ton. But then when it's quoted and sold into the market, it is quoted as dollars per ounce, okay? So which means that's a lot of the people who are in the mining industry need to do some mathematics, gymnastic, yeah? So other minerals are often found alongside gold due to the geology of the rock. Most common is gold, silver, and copper, or PGMs and gold. Now, PGMs are the platinum group metals, which also incorporate gold. And PGMs are such like platinum, palladium, rhodium, iridium, and uh, another one I thought of, the, the name just escaped me. But the most highly valued one is actually um, palladium and rhodium. In fact, during its height, palladium actually was so far ahead of gold, okay? It cost about 2,400 per ounce of palladium, but right now has fallen below 2,000. And rhodium was actually more than 10,000 per ounce. And that's how PGMs are in terms of pricing, but platinum currently trades at 800 over per ounce, which is far below their peak in 2011 when it was above the price of gold. When gold was 1,920 per ounce at its peak, platinum was 2,100 plus. So actually platinum far outpaced gold in terms of pricing, but right now platinum is behind gold. So some believe that one of the one of the investment should be in platinum bullion rather than gold bullion because um, during the historical trend platinum actually have outpaced gold but gold right now is the reserve asset of many central banks okay now the combination of the minerals are calculated as total AUEQ or total gold equivalent. So sometimes people would not uh, put their reserve or resources as how many ounces of platinum group metals, okay, or how many pounds of copper. They will just lump it based on the current price of copper or platinum 
and then relate back to goal, just doing some mathematics, uh, gymnastic here, and then they come up with the total goal equivalent. And that is how they calculate their total resources. So this is a measurement example, and this is taken from K92 mining, okay, where you have the average cutoff grade of the rock sample measuring 3.1 tons. 3.1 million tons contains 9.4 gram ton per ton of gold, giving an indicated gold resource of 950,000 ounces of gold. Okay, so it also contains 15.2 gram per ton of silver, giving an indicated resource of 1.5 million ounces of silver and 0.61% of copper, giving an indicated resource of 19 kiloton of copper. So how they actually work backwards. Okay, now this is just gold and this is silver and this is copper. So they calculate everything and then the indicated resource in gold equivalent is 1.1 million ounce. So the conversion is based on the present price of the minerals versus gold. So this is how a report is normally generated. Okay, if they have three different types of minerals, they would put gold, silver, copper. Sometimes they have um, platinum group metals. Okay, they would actually stipulate um, like platinum, palladium, or even rhodium. And the lesser known like iridium and such is actually put as others because the price is does not have great significance. So eventually everything is quoted back into how many ounce of gold equivalent. Then let's look at the reserves and resources. How are they determined? Now, first of all, before reserves and resources are determined, there's a need to do airborne magnetic survey so that they understand the geology of the rock, strata below, and then they identify targets. Once they have identified targets, then they have the first drill sampling. After the first drill sampling, there will be subsequent drills to determine extension of the targets and to build a resources portfolio. Once the resources portfolio are determined, then further extensive mining would help to determine the reserves. Now, why is it important to distinguish between resources and reserves? Because reserves are what that the miners can mine economically or commercially. Resources doesn't provide enough information for the miners to actually undertake the production out of the resources, but it certainly helps for them to determine the extent of the reserves so that they can mine the asset profitably. So let's look at reserve, proven and probable reserves, measured metal and minerals which can, which can be mined economically or commercially. This is where major miners would pay top dollars to acquire a company with significant reserves. Investor will also consider a company's reserves as stock value asset in the ground. So that is why sometimes people may not want to buy gold bullion, but rather investors may want to invest in companies that have very high reserves because it's like having gold stored in the ground. And when the gold is stored in the ground, you can benefit from the extraction of it. And also, you no need to pay the annual service charge. You know, like if you keep it in a private vault, you need to pay annual charges. So it's like if I invest in a company with very um, good reserves, you know, it's free of charge, the storage. You know, I just buy the stock of the company. So that is why investors will consider company that is worthwhile to invest if the company have good reserves. Now, one thing you should understand about um, gold mining stock is that people invest in companies that are not even generating any revenue, okay? And we will come to that later because that belongs in the exploration stage. So inevitably, when gold or silver prices are high, miners often have higher PE ratio because investors are willing to pay for the improved performance and also the value of the reserves held in its mines. So for example, if the company has, you know, is 
has a PE of 30. It may not be specifically saying that the price is just based on the earnings, but also the price is based on the confirmed reserves within its ground. So for example, um, on an average, let's say that some people, if gold continue to move up high, then per ounce of gold held in the ground may be like currently is let's say it's forty ounce uh forty dollars per ounce but if gold becomes two thousand or three thousand dollars per ounce then that value will not no longer be forty dollars per ounce it could go as high as hundred or hundred and fifty dollars per ounce because it follows the price movement of gold and that is why the PE ratio sometimes would be very high and also, when people look at the PE ratio, wow, you know, it's so high, then I shouldn't invest, you know, because it's not worth, uh, you know, it's way overvalued. No, because it also take into consider consideration the value of the gold that is stored in the ground. So resource, we have measured and indicated resources, and this is the estimated metal or mineral resources, which have been made with an acceptable level of confidence. Measured and indicated resources carry some value, but it is often smaller than proven and probable reserves. Exploration companies often see their share price increase when drilling results reveal significant increase in the company's measured and indicated resources. So whenever an exploration company, they do drilling, and as soon as they announce a huge find, then their share price for the exploring company can actually move up very high. Um, just to share with you, a company that recently found 140 gram per meter of rock, in, uh, one meter of 140, one meter of 143 gram per ton of rock, suddenly so see its share price move from six six cents all the way to nine cents just because of that one particular drill because that is the early stage exploration but then people say that hey you know if that one major find in that one drill can extend over a wider horizon within the strata of rock then that means the measure and indicated resources could be very high and therefore investors rush into the share pushing up its price you know forcing it to increase 50% over a matter of a few weeks. Okay, and some of them continuous find of high um high value of gold per ton of rock in one particular stock has seen its price rising from less than 10 cents and over the course of more than a month becomes 45 cents. And that's exploration stage, you know, they have zero revenue. And that is why a lot of uh, speculators like to invest in exploration companies. And exploration companies can be very, very uh, profitable if they hit the right kind of uh, rock strata. But as many as successes there are, there are often a lot of failures as well because some exploration companies continue to dilute their shareholder base without doing much of anything. And then that is why investing in exploration companies can have can be very, very high risk. But if they do hit certain meaningful fines, okay, you invest in that company and they have subsequent major fines, then you can see many, you know, multiple gains within a short period of time. And but to do that, you need to be really good at understanding. The surrounding area, which companies have participated in certain finds, the location of uh, gold mines that are already producing within range of the asset. So there's a lot of things that you need to look at to determine whether that geology is extended to the existing asset based on the surrounding mines performance. Yeah. So, but often explorer exploration companies have a much higher risk. Then you have inferred resources, estimated metal or mineral resources, which have been made with a low level of confidence.
this hardly result in any significant increase in the value of the company share price. Any increase is often a flash in the pan, which means as soon as it goes up, within days or a few weeks later, it will come back down because there's a lack of follow up. So reserve statement. Now this is from um, from B to Go, a uh, uh, mid cap mining company. Okay, you can see that how they put it as probable mineral reserves. They have total probable reserves of 5.8 million ounces, okay, because it's times 1,000. So that's how they come up with, you have the grid here, okay, then they times it with the tons of rock, and that is how they derive the, in terms of ounces after conversion. Then their total probable mineral reserves is 5.8 million ounces. And here, they have the measured mineral resources, about 950,000 ounces, indicated mineral resources of 1.9 million ounces. So total indicated mineral resources, okay, is about fifth, um, sorry, the total of indicated mineral resource here is 15 million ounce, not one, 1 1.9 million, yeah. My total indicated is 15 million ounce. So if we look at it, the total measured and indicated resources, therefore, is 15 million point nine eight ounce. And that is quite huge. Then they have another called the inferred mineral resources, and here it is 6.7 million ounce. So in total, if we want to count resources, then we can count total inferred resources plus measured and indicated resources, which is closer to about 22 million ounces. But these are not proven reserves. Okay, proven reserves are here, which is 5.8 million ounces. So this is what investors will pay top dollar for. This for here, um, some amount of money, but here is really meaningless. And investors wouldn't consider this additional 6.7 million ounce of inferred resources because it has low confidence level. So another thing that you need to understand is minus financial jargons, and it can be very overwhelming. But it's very easy to understand. Okay, here I simplify it as cash cost. Now this term is found in many mining companies' financials. It is the cost of production. It is the operational cost, which include transport, refining, and on-site administration costs and royalties, but exclude head office charges, depreciation, or amortization. Then you have the total cost, which is cash cost plus depreciation or amortization charges. But the most important thing that help you determine whether a miner is actually very profitable or not is the all-in sustaining cost, which is the total cost. Okay, here plus capital to sustain the mine plus exploration cost plus head office charges. So in this sense, it is all-in cost of running that mine, but it is not fixed. A company with multiple mines may have different AISC for each mine and a single AISC at a company level. Okay, which means that of all the AICs of so many mines, they average it down to one single AIC at the company level when they report their financials. AISC is the most commonly used in precious metal mining companies. Um, in copper, in uh, iron, they seldom use AISC, rather they use the term cash cost. So let's look at the importance of AISC. It gives the investors an indication of the company's mining operations efficiency. It helps determine the profitability of a mining company. Now, if the AISC is $1,200 per ounce, based on the current price of gold of $1,750 per ounce, the profit to the company is $550 per ounce. Okay, now look at this. 
if gold reached 2000 per ounce, the company profit will be $800 per ounce because there's no impact on the, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, cost, okay, the production cost, because no matter how they, how they, how they manage the mine, during a particular shift with so many trucks they can and excavators, they can only excavate so much million of ton per rock at any time. Okay, and all the costs have already built in. So anything that is going to change the profitability of the company would be the change in the gold price. So that is why, you know, I'm saying that gold mining companies are very, very profitable right now because not only gold price has appreciated, but US dollar is also much higher versus emerging economies currency. And therefore, labor cost is also low. That brings the AISC lower. And because oil is widely used in gold mining companies, with oil price having fallen quite significantly, the AISC is brought down even lower. So that is why gold mining companies are very profitable. Now, assuming gold actually reached 3,000, then the company's profit will be $1,800 per ounce. And a lot of investors are betting that gold would actually go towards 5,000, okay? Over the next five years, um, possibly, because it's already every investor that is in the gold mining industry knows that the Federal Reserve will never be able to raise back the interest rate, which means if the Fed say they will go back into normalcy, is all lies. Because if they have gone back to normalcy, they would have done so in 2018, even as the stock market crashed. But when the stock market crashed, the Fed starts to pan started to panic. And that is why zero interest rate is for long term. Eventually, Federal Reserve will go full Japanization of its entire policy. And that means that gold would actually continue to go up because if the Fed would have done so, they would have already done it and not say that we will do so in the future because the market has become too addicted to the easy money from the Federal Reserve. The moment the Federal Reserve pull out the support, the market will crash. So rest assured, now that the stock market is in the red for the past two days, the Federal, the Federal Reserve would soon be announcing some policies if it continues to fall another 10%. And I'm pretty sure the Trump admin and Congress will drum up another trillion dollar policy. And if you have looked at the US debt clock, okay, you can actually look it up. It's under usdebtclock.org. US debt, government debt per GDP is already 130%. And by the time it reached end of this year, it will likely be 150% of GDP. When Greece was reaching 140% of GDP, you know, everyone is saying that Greece will default. In fact, the US would have defaulted on its debt simply because it is the world reserve currency they can print at any time they want. Okay, but the US reserve currency is being threatened because a lot of other central banks are very cheesed off with the U.S. Federal Reserve because they like they are like printing money like no tomorrow, okay, and they still think that they should hold the reserve currency. Already, central bankers, um, um, central bankers from Russia and China are voicing that there need to be a return to the gold standard. So, back to the AIC. Now, AIC is never fixed. That's one thing you should know. If the company during the course of its production decide to expand exploration or incur capital investment to improve or expand the mining operation, then the AISC over that period would actually increase. But because if they use it for capital investment, then the efficiency of the mine would improve and gradually the AISC would be much lower versus the percentage of um, revenue. 
okay because it means that more milling um, and more rocks could be processed that means higher production but in terms of exploration yes you know if you if a company performed exploration it is not yet converted into production yet but exploration if a good find will actually help to improve the share price so let's look at a miners transition a mining company often starts with exploration and then they have measurement of resources and during this time if any significant find some hungry um mid cap mining company or big cap mining company would want to acquire that company because they already can smell the potential then that's the feasibility study and if the feasibility studies come out that the discounted cash flow the npv over that the life of mine lom let's say the life of mine is 10 years you know the discounted cash flow and the npv all those would net present value would actually be significant then that company will also be acquired and then construction of the plant and this stage also you know interested mining companies would also look at possibility of acquiring it and then when it comes to production they also will be destined for acquisition because a lot of all this is different stages but the cost of acquisition would actually increase so a junior miner and exploration company could be acquired by a major miner at the determination of a large resort deposits or during the revelation of a feasibility study during the construction phase of the plant and even upon production however the acquisition price at each um, at each different stage rises so this is one thing you should know because of the money that is spent in developing the mine and as the mine more money is put into developing the mine the mine becomes more and more expensive for acquisition so that's the reason why there's a there's a rush for mining m and a's especially during last year and this year because senior gold mining companies are seeing a 42 percent decline in terms of reserves now one thing senior gold companies are those major producers so major producers sometimes they are more concerned about efficiency of the mining asset and also exploration of the existing mining asset rather than going into green fields okay none explore land before and you know expand the human resources and the capital expenditure on trying to find the next big deposit so all this is quite wasteful to the senior mining comp senior mining companies or major producers they are more willing to pay and grab a company that has very strong reserves to actually back up their existing reserves because that is very efficient to them rather than spending money sending people into far away lands to look for the next great find so minus classification there are the producers and explorers major producer focus on production with some exploration normally within the confines of their at mine of their mines okay prefer to acquire assets to boost resources mainly large cap companies the junior producer focus on mine development with some production and continual exploration to increase resources mainly small to mid cap companies now junior producers to some extent you know they may hope that they will be acquired and that's why they need to continuously to do exploration to increase their resources so that their company becomes attractive to investors not only for acquisition but then to build up the market cap of the company so that's why junior producer have a lot of incentive to explore then the exploration company is normally a startup company with land for exploration but no production mainly micro cap companies now these companies do not have revenue okay unlike a lot of exchanges which which have regulations that you must have minimum how many years of revenue generating or how many years of net profit before you are allowed to lease but for exploration company it's actually zero revenue but they are all the same they are allowed to list especially in Canada and in the in Australia startup companies in exploration are seldom traded 
are seldom listed in US, but it's listed in Canada, but then it's made available to US investors under the US OTC market. And a lot of the startups in uh, Canada or in Australia actually become multi-billion dollar company. Now, one such company is called Kirtland Lake Gold, which actually started, uh, which actually about five to six years ago was only worth one dollar Canada. Okay. And within that, we, since 2015 or 2016, I can't recall the actual time, but at one time it was at one, sorry, one US dollar. It eventually went up to 50 US dollar over several years because they found a very rich resource and they started to have production and they discovered another rich resor uh, uh, resource nearby. So that company share price starts to escalate. Now, another company I like to share is actually in Australia uh, called San Barbara Mining. The, in fact, San Barbara Mining was very badly managed from one over Aussie dollar. It fell down to eight cents. But after a total change of management, San Barbara Mining actually went, I think in a period of about, again, six to seven, um, again, I think it was uh, uh, six to seven years, it eventually become a $4 company. Now you imagine eight cents to $4, that's a huge lot, okay, of, uh, of uh, multiple gains. So that is why, um, those people with knowledge of the industry would often know where to put the money in for where exploration companies are concerned. But for those that without the knowledge, it can be a very high risk venture. You cannot say that I look at, you know, if Australia had 50, 50 uh, small cap company, companies, then I, you know, every of the company I invest 1000 and hopefully, you know, out of 10, I will strike it rich. No, it doesn't work that way. It's not like select any company, you will make money. Some actually become much worse, okay? From, from let's say 10 cents, it can fall all the way below one cent, okay? So, um, but the incentive for those people in the know to, act, to invest in exploration company is there. Otherwise, some people, if you are new, I would recommend that you look at junior producer, which means those that are going to start gold production in the coming one or two quarters because their mine is fully developed or they are existing producers but at a lower price and then um, i mean at a lower quantity smaller quantity versus the large cap now most of the large cap are already doing well for example newcrest is trading at more than 30 dollars uh, per share uh, Barrick is trading at, I think, $23 or $24 per share. And Pan American Silver is trading at uh, close to $20 plus per share as well. Okay, and then those bigger companies like Newmont, uh, Franco, Nevada, they are in the $60 over dollars range. So if you have missed all the, all the big caps, then, you know, look at the junior producer. Then let's look at one major producer, Barrick Gold. And for disclosure, I do own Barrick Gold. It's listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the code GOLD. Barrick has mining operations and projects in 15 countries, production of 1.25 million ounces of gold and 115 million pounds of copper. AISC for gold is $954 per ounce. Now, if you look at it, if gold is already trading at about 1,750, that is, actually close to about $800 per ounce in profit, okay? And copper is $2.04 per pound. Copper, I think right now it's about $2.66. Then that means per pound, that is an easy 60 cents profit. So Q1 2020 revenue of uh, 2.7 billion. Q1 2020 net profit of 400 million. Now, previously I mentioned that Gold has already outperformed the S&P. So how did Barrick perform versus the SPY, which is the S&P ETF? You can see that Barrick over the past five years has gained 
okay, 135.6%, whereas the S&P ETF only 48.72. Because over the last five years, we have a down period, okay, in 2018, and another down period just a few months ago. And that is why the S&P has not been able to trend higher, but you look at Barrick, it's already moving up. So, you know, some, I, I would like to quote Warren Buffett, who said that gold is nothing but a pet rock. And I think Buffett is totally wrong in this case, okay? Because the monetary easing policy of central bank, not only the Federal Reserve, but major central banks, including the ECB, BOJ, and even the PBOC, is putting a lot of investors into the gold mining sphere as well as in the physical bullion sphere because that is a ultimate hedge against possible hyperinflation when you have too much money circulates circulating chasing fewer goods that will be the end result would be hyperinflation and what we are witnessing now is that prices may be low the fed will always say that the prices are low but actually um the Federal Reserve has been manipulating the how inflation is being calculated. And if you want to find out more how the Fed actually changed the goalposts in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the inflation, you can actually go to shadowstats.com, uh, where one particular person has been tracking that since 1982, 82 or 84, the Federal Reserve has been changing the criteria for inflation to keep inflation down so that they can continue to print money to help support the economy because they think that the inflation target has not been raised so much so that if you go to that particular site you can see that auto vehicles have zero inflation rate even though the price of a car since 1980 to now have obviously increased many hundreds of percent but because they use the criteria that increase in price comes with the increase in quality and therefore there should not there is no indication of inflation so for example last time cars have no air con right now you pay a higher price but that's and that's air control in so that's zero inflation and that's how they keep the inflation suppressed it is worth a look i would urge you to go to shadowstats.com and then you will see how the fed has manipulated the inflation rate so that to keep inflation low while promising a much higher inflation target so that they can continue printing money to support the market so junior producer b2 gold i used to own b2 gold but i sold it uh, with a good profit of 100 over percent um, listed on the new york stock exchange american or mx market under code btg now, three mines in production, one in development, and two in exploration stage. Operation across six countries. Expected to produce more than 1 million ounce of gold in 2020. AISC for gold is $820 per ounce. That means that it's almost $930 per ounce. You see that because of its low AISC, it is even more profitable per ounce versus barrack. Q1 2020 revenue of 380 million ounce, uh, sorry, $380 million and net profit of $83 million. And you look at Barrick, uh, sorry, B2 Go, B2 Go over the last five years have increased 227% versus the S&P ETF SPY 48%. Okay, so you can see the vast difference. Okay, ever since the uh, Federal Reserve has continued all this monetary policy to help boost the market, but then it is pushing people into gold and causing the price of gold to move higher. And for those of you um, uh, who are still in the dark, the ultra rich have spent more money accumulating gold in private walls than the entire investors' investment into the gold ETFs. Okay, that is what is happening. And that's why the ultra-rich keep on accumulating bullion gold. Now this is an explorer 
company, Great Southern Mining. I do own Great Southern Mining. It's listed on the Australia Stock Exchange under code GSN. Early stage explorer with two projects in Australia. Early drill results at Cox Fine yielded impressive results with the highest being at 133 gram of gold per ton of rock. And this is how Great Southern has performed versus the S&P ETF. Now this is adjusted to Australia dollar, okay? Because the US dollar has gained versus the US uh, Australia dollar over the five years, the gain is much higher. It's at 52%, but look at Great Southern. It's up 330%. Then royalty companies, now these are non-producers. These companies acquire land with mineral potential and then lease it to the producers. In return, they charge a royalty based on a fixed percentage and on a predetermined price of gold. The royalty is not payable in cash, but payable in physical gold. So what these royalty companies do is that they have a contract that you must, out of the gold produced, you must give me, let's say, 1% or 2%. So they accumulate the gold. And the royalty company is in no hurry to sell them. But they wait when the price of gold is up, then they sell them, then they make even more money. Because how much that price of gold is to be paid is already predetermined in the contract. It doesn't mean that the price of gold increase. The mining company will come back to this royalty, royalty company and say, that, hey, 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 you know, I want to reduce the amount of physical gold payable to you because gold have increased in price. No, it's not done this way. It is payable in physical gold, the amount of which has been predetermined, either in terms of quantity or in price. For example, they say that they would have to pay that royalty in US dollar, but that US dollar is com can be converted into physical gold based on $1,200 or $1,400 per ounce. So not only then they get the gold from the miner, but they got it at a very cheap rate that is based on 1,002 or 1,400. Now, if gold is $2,000 per ounce, then that means that if the contract is determined at 1,200, they have $800 per ounce in terms of profit. And if let's say 400, they have $600 per ounce in profit. And that is why royalty companies like Franco Nevada and Newmont can be more than $60 over dollars per share. Okay, they also provide financing to the producers with options to own shares in the company. So if let's say the producer is junior producer, they don't have the financing, they will say, okay, this is a good piece of land, provided that you spend so much of that money into exploration, which we will finance, but in return, I want how many millions of your share. So when this is normally done when the company, I think have very good inkling of how much resource are in the ground because they've done certain surveys. Okay, then they will always negotiate the best deal. So if that company started to produce gold on a very high volume, then the share price will actually increase. And then this royalty company can dispose of that share and make additional money besides the royalty. So they are often seen as less risky investment versus actual producers because they only invest in the land. They don't incur debt, so much debt as into starting up the uh, construction of a plant, which can be very costly, okay? And then it takes many years. So they just accumulate as many land as possible, and then they start to lease out the land to the miners. So they are often less risky because their debt level are mostly much lower than the um, producers. So one royalty company is called Eligo, listed on the TSX under code ELY, US OTC market under code ELYGF. Now, three projects producing royalties, eight projects to reach production in 2023, 22 projects under development, eight projects at exploration stage. Now, this is why I like, I myself also own Eligo, and that is why I like Eligo, because it is one of the lowest market cap in terms of royalty companies versus Newmont and, uh, and Franco Nevada. Okay, for example, this company market cap, okay, is around 100 to 500 million. Okay, consider a junior royalty company. But if they move up to the mid-tier, their market cap would be around 
500 million to 2 billion. Now, one, one of the mid term, uh, mid cap royalty company is Sandstorm Gold. It is 1.2 or 1.3 billion. So that means for Eli Gold, which I think currently sits at less than maybe around 200 million, for it to move to 1.2 billion implies a six times multiples. Okay, I don't think Eli within a very short term would reach, let's say, you know, 5 billion market cap. But somewhere around here, I won't be surprised that they will be acquired. Okay, which means that if it move up six times multiples, then there's another acquisition and you times it with another uh, 50% or so, then that becomes a nine times multiples. Okay, so uh, that's why I like Eli Go. And this is how Eli Go has performed versus the S&P. Over the last five years, it has increased 2,933% versus the S&P ETFs of 48%, okay? So I think right now, most of you would say, oh my gosh, you know, can it really be real? Well, some people really might have held it for a very long time, but I actually bought it somewhere at about 60 cents, okay? So right now at about $1.30 over cents, yes, you know, uh, within, I bought it in April and uh, within two months, I already achieved a gain of about 120%. So go minus ETF, you have the GDX and GDXJ. Now these are the two most widely traded ETFs. GDX is the ETF for major gold mining companies and GDXJ is the ETF for the junior gold mining companies. So this is how GDX has performed over the last five years. It still outperformed the S&P, okay, at 85.46% versus 46.23%. Now, GDX and ETF holds about uh, collectively about, I think, um, around 20 mining stocks, okay? And these are all the major mining stocks. For example, you know, you have names like Newcrest, uh, Newmont, uh, Barrick, you know, these are actually the major producer. Still, it managed to beat the S&P. And if you look at the GDXJ, GDXJ normally over the long term outperformed the GDX, but so far GDXJ is underperforming the GDX. GDXJ only increased 80.17% versus the GDX. So that means that the GDXJ is still undervalued because over long term, like what happened during 2011, the GDXJ was worth $166, whereas GDX at that time was only $66. So that is why if that's, you need to put money, I think the GDXJ would be a better option, okay? So conclusion, now miners are great leverage play. If gold and silver price increase 1%, fundamentally sound miners can appreciate between 3 to 9%. However, the risks are higher due to the leverage factor. GDX and GDXJ are lower risk versus individual miners as better miners can outperform the weaker miners within the ETFs itself. Gold and silver are often the subject of bullion banks manipulation, especially during the options expiry date. Now, this you must know. Owning gold and silver stocks, let me warn you, can be very nerve wracking. I can see some of my stocks that after a severe dumping by the bullion bank can trigger more than 10% fall in price. But because I know that the Federal Reserve would continue to print money over the, over the long term, the fundamentals for gold is there to stay. But you must have the nerves of steel to withstand that kind of selling pressure. Now, there's a reason why bullion banks want to manipulate the gold futures market. Especially, the bullion banks work together with the Bank of International Settlement. Because, number one, if gold is allowed to rise exponentially, it will signal a currency crisis, and that would destabilize the entire global economy. So, that's why they try to manipulate gold to see whether the price. Uh, to prevent the price from moving too far up. But meanwhile, I can tell you that there's a change coming, okay? If you look at the topic for the World Economic Forum 
in January 2021, it is called the Great Reset. And last year at Jackson Hole, Mark Carney, the Bank of England gov governor. In Jackson Hole means in US territory, yeah, where all the central bankers gather. He specifically mentioned that the days of the US dollar as a reserve currency is numbered. And guess what? Mark Carney is touted to spearhead the IMF transformation of digital currency. Okay. So which means in this global reset, the World Economic Forum, I anticipate that most likely they will set a deadline for some kind of digital currency. It could be a one world digital currency. And if you look at the behavior of central banks, especially central banks of um, Germany, central banks of Austria, Poland, Hungary, China, Russia, India, Turkey, have all been accumulating gold. Now, the, why is that? Unless gold would have some role in the future, presumably, this is just my opinion, okay? It, it's not stated in concrete yet, okay? But presumably, something must be linked to gold eventually. Because right now, it is the world total debt is about 300 and 30 to 350 percent of the global GDP. And the only way to wipe the slate clean of this entire global debt, one economist said that gold need to be around $50,000 per ounce, but I doubt that will happen. But in any case, what they would be, what would likely happen would be a percentage of gold would be used to back a certain, maybe a certain digital currency and paving way for a reserve currency that may include gold. Now, these are some of the options that are being discussed, including two previously well-known economists from the, either from the World Bank or from the Bank of International Settlement. And governor, bank governors, central bank governors of Russia and China has been fighting for some reinstatement of gold in the reserve currency. So that is why, as the global economy becomes too overburdened with debt, a change will be coming. And that is why the World Economic Forum has the title calling itself, calling it the Great Reset. So it will be interesting and see how this will unwind. So my disclosure, I own Barrick Gold, Great Southern Mining, and Eli Gold. Okay. And now we have the Q&A session. Thank you very much. PC for your wonderful sharing about the uh, gold and silver mining industry. I believe that uh, most of us here have a better understanding about how the industry works. I think we have learned about what are the producer, what are the exploration companies, and what are the royalty companies, and what are the financial jargons that we have uh, that is used in the in this mining industry, such as uh, cash costs or in sustainable costs, so that uh, we, are, we are all more aware. Now, many, many uh, people will find that the mining industry is a tough industry to understand because in Malaysia, we, we, we don't have uh, many mining companies. So this is a uh, rather uh, you know, unfamiliar charter to many of us. And uh, I believe this session has cleared uh, the air for, you know, for, for many of us. Okay, if you find that uh, gold and silver, it's a rock that cannot give you dividend that you may want to consider silver and a gold mining companies because not only you own an ownership to the uh, to the company so when the when the when the gold price go up you can also get dividend okay so you have capital appreciation and the dividend so this is the beauty of investing in the gold and silver uh, mining industry and personally i also own uh, some of the gold and mining industries uh, in the us Okay, so if you have any question, you can ask the speaker, uh, please uh, write it down uh, in the question box. So we actually have a large number of questions ready. Okay, actually today we have already exceeded the time limit uh, because we're supposed to end at 9.45. So now we are, but uh, we will extend this for a little bit so that uh, we can address your question. So number one is, uh, what is the benchmark P ratio for miners? Uh, you have any uh, benchmark? Actually, much as I mentioned, the Miners, you need to actually look at the reserve that is held in the ground and also its performance. So that's why 
um, rest assured that most of the miners have a PE, PE ratio of around 20 something to 30 something. That's quite the uh, average that I've come across. But I don't always evaluate a miner based on PE ratio. Okay, and um, especially mining, especially all companies in the US, you should even pay less attention to the PE ratio because they are well known to borrow money, to fund share buyback, to re to so as to as to make the earnings per share higher to reflect a lower PE ratio. And that's why, and this is across the board. And that's why companies like Boeing, you know, do you know that Boeing actually have negative equity? Okay, because they have too much debt. So they borrow too much money to actually influence the earnings. And that's why I tend not to look too deeply into the PE ratio, but rather, you know, my benchmark would be, let's say the share price over the net asset value per share is operating cash flow, is debt to equity ratio, is current ratio. These are the benchmarks that I often look at because per earnings, especially in US company, is too easily influenced by share buyback funded by debt. Okay, excellent. So uh, the next question is, do you know what is the average AISC for the miners? It depends on where the country is located. Now, AISC for the US is often around 1,000 to 1,200 in Canada as well because those are developed countries and the cost of labor is much higher. Therefore, I often want to look at, and even Australia is also quite high, you know, therefore, Miners with exposure in Latin America, South America, in Africa, or even the hottest one is actually in um, in Papua New Guinea. Actually, uh, that's where Can 92 is. The AISC is actually less than 1,000. And but the AISC is also dependent on the quality of the of the per gram tonnage of gold. For example, um, in Australia. The, ton, the gram per tonnage of gold, uh, per tonnage of rock is so high that the AIC is the world's lowest, okay? Be because one ton of rock can really deliver so many ounces of gold. Therefore, that particular uh, um, area in Australia have one of the world's lowest AISC at less than $400 per ounce because of the heavy gramage per ton of rock. So that depends on the geology as well. First, Location, second, geology. Then that would influence the AISC. There's no average that you can say that, um, you know, Australia, the average is actually 1,200. But in that specific geology, because of the high grammage of gold per ton of rock, it's the AISC is just 400, you know? So you cannot have, you cannot look at AISC in that manner. And AISC will actually increase if the company decides to spend more money in exploration. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so the next question is from uh, Lim is that why is the US dollar still so high despite all the printing? Because other banks are printing more. <laughs> okay, that's, 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 the, that's the way I look at it. Now, what is happening is that if US dollar, if US, if the Federal Reserve is printing money, but other central bankers are not, then you know, that is the US dollar would devalue versus other currencies because the entire world central banks are actually printing money just the same. So the status quo more or less remains the same. And that's why US dollar remain relatively much higher versus, uh, versus emerging currencies. And, but if you look at the value of US dollar in gold terms, then gold already telling you that the US dollar is undervalued. Mm, okay. Now, can you comment on the uh, San Barbara because the price dropped from $4 to about $2 plus. There's the questions. Well, actually, I at one time, Santa, uh, San Barbara was actually uh, $0.08. Cents. It went all the way to 4 but I think they encountered some difficulties or wrong investment that subsequently their share price actually starts to fall. That's why a decision by the management to undertake a certain risky venture in the mining industry can be very telling. Now, there is one particular uh, gold mining company that was doing very well, but then they have an accident in the shaft because it's, a, it's an underground mine that they have closed for a few months and subsequently the share price never recovered. So these are the risks investing in um, 
in some of the mining companies. That um, of course the safest one, okay, is to invest in those with open pit mine. But that itself is also a risk, although it did not happen in the gold mining industry, but it happened in the iron mining industry in Brazil, where Vail, the giant iron ore producer, actually have a failure of a dam that 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 is actually filled up with the tailings. Tailings are those waste water that caused the dam to burst and inundated an entire village, causing, I think, about more than 300 over deaths. So open pit have its own risk, underground also have their own risk. And that is why, you know, try not to put all money into one particular mining company. You must have a few, okay, so that there will be some that is ex at exploration stage, some would be in the uh, production stage and also please have some in royalty companies because they don't partake in those risks they just lease the land and that that is why i also like royalty companies mm, okay so would you what do you think about barvas listed on bursa malaysia is it a good minor stock to have so there's the next question i do invest in barvas okay but barvas to me has not reached the stage of a total mining company. Now, if you go to Buffett's website, they never stipulate what are their reserves. They never stipulate what are their measured and indicated resources. They never even mention, okay, what their progress of work is. For example, we are now exploring uh, the the uh, the uh, the the sulfites at the lower ground level. And and this hour, uh, and we have targeted uh, drilling. How many, how many thousand meters of drill? You know all these specifics. Buffett did not mention. So although it can say that, you know, it does gain from the increase in price of gold because U.S. dollar versus ringgit has actually appreciated. Okay, it does benefit from that, but it is still far away from being a true mining company because they never state their intention of what they want to do. Okay. They never state the resources, they never state the reserves. So you can't have a clear information of Buffett. I imagine Buffett is purely for speculation because US dollar convert to ringgit, as long as they mine gold, gold price goes up, then the stock should benefit. That's my only rationale. But that's why I don't put a lot of money in Buffett, okay? And um, if it really want to be taken seriously as a mining company, it needs to, do what other mining companies are because if they announce their reserve, they announce their resources, then people will pay top bucks for the amount of gold held in, in the ground. But because all these are not disclosed, therefore the share price doesn't seem the kind of move. Okay, like, like one particular company, uh, Great Southern Mining, the moment they announce that they are going to have a new drilling in the area where they discovered a high gold grade, you know, the share price immediately took off without even looking at the result, you know? So that is why, you know, Buffett has remained pretty stagnant. Mm, okay. Does that answer your Thank question? You. I, okay, if you answer your question, okay, please uh, <laughs> comment back for the person asking the question. <laughs> Let us know if it, uh, it helps in dissecting the company of Buffett. Yeah, so Buffett also got their marine product divisions are uh, not entirely a miners company. Okay, let, let's go to this uh, miners company in SGX called CNMC. What, what, what is your comment about this company? Is that a value stock? Um, actually, stock? I, don't Do look at, I don't look at uh, I don't look at SGX mining companies here because it is not a miners paradise. Um, SGX to me is a REIT paradise, but not a miners paradise. Because if you want to look at resource, you go to where there are the most startup, the most companies that are very engaging in the resource industry, namely Canada, Australia, and US. So these are where I look for in mining companies and sometimes at UK, okay? For example, uh, companies uh, like Ashanti Gold, um, because you, um, UK previously being a colonial master in Africa, there's a lot of companies that are actually invested in the African gold mining scene. So I will look at these four countries as being a miners paradise where I can check companies, I can look at them, you know, and 
Singapore is just a small, uh, small number of companies that actually, you know, decided to venture into the mining industry. That's why I'm not keen to look at the SGX. It doesn't give me the wealth of company to actually select from. All right. So the next question is, uh, you see, uh, most of the uh, mining companies have dual listing is TSX Venture and also American Stock Exchange. So how do we decide which exchange to invest in? Now, of course, um, those that are available in the TSX Ventures, they are available in the US under the US OTC market. And not all investment banks in Malaysia actually uh, allows you to buy OTC because they say that there's a risk factor. Um, yes, there is some risk factor and also the OTC market is not an actual exchange market. It is a market that is controlled by the market makers. So which means the spread can be quite large between buy and sell. Okay, and that, therein lies the risk. And of course, because, because it's not a proper exchange, therefore investment banks seldom uh, invest. Uh, investment banks seldom allow people to invest in the OTC market. So you have to be careful if you are investing in the OTC market. And oftentimes you can actually refer to the Toronto Stock Exchange. Okay, look at the company studies, financials, if everything is okay, then yeah, go ahead. I actually invest quite a lot of mining companies under the OTC as well. Okay, uh, simply because, you know, I have no access to the Canada market um, and I do not want to go uh, into the international broker, uh, uh, international brokerage companies. Um, but I think I might have to because my volume of transaction in mining companies is actually moving higher and higher. You know, uh, you know, I'm actually uh, looking at eventually moving into uh, uh, an international brokerage firm because the transaction rate is actually much lower um, in that sense. But the thing is, if you have access to the uh, access to the uh, U.S. market, look at those in the U.S. market, especially the NYSE MX, MX market. Okay, okay there's a lot yeah. of stock there. Yeah, on the Gananga platform, you can also access uh, not only the gold ETF, but also uh, not only the gold ETF or the GDX or the GDXJ, you can also buy all the listed companies based in the U.S. Okay, so if there are miners are listed on the U.S. platform, then you'll be able to buy into these mining companies. So the next question is, uh, what do you think about Next Metal? It's listed on uh, ASX. Next Metal, I've not looked at that company. Um, I don't know. Okay. okay. Um, I would. Um, next question. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, the next question is, what do you think? What do you forecast the? The price for spot gold uh, because some of them, I mean, some of the attendees are not trading gold. <laughs> I think you shouldn't trade gold. You should treat gold as a store of uh, storage of wealth. Okay, which means because over the long term, with all this money printing, the gold price would actually move higher. Okay, and if you trade gold, sometimes gold, as I say, is subject to manipulation. You know, suddenly the gold price can actually fall thirty dollars per ounce. So where does that put you? But if you treat gold as a long-term wealth protection, then you can actually make your money over the long term. Okay. So gold bullion is something that you buy for wealth protection. If you want to make money for uh in wealth creation, then you have to look at the um, you have to look at the um, mining companies because that will allow you to, because as I mentioned, they have a one to three times leverage. Mm, okay. All right. Um, I guess uh, we still have so many more questions coming in. Uh. Just, uh, just do one last question before we hit 10 o'clock. No, what kind? What do you think about some of the mining uh, shares on the uh, ASX? Uh, would you uh, recommend some? Um, as I mentioned, I, I do own GSN. Okay, you want the bigger players that would be North, uh, North Star, if I'm not wrong. 
North Star and then New Press. You can also look at Rio Tinto and uh, and uh, BHP Billiton. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, if uh, if you want to go into the gold mining company, Kananga also offer you to access the US OTC market. Huh? So yeah, remember remember this. Okay, right now we have uh, come to the uh, conclusion of this webinar. So uh, let me take over the presenter control. Just give me a minute. All right, so thank you so much for tuning in. So if you have not signed up with an account with Kananga, you can also fill in the form that I put in in the uh, Q&A box and also the chat box. You can go to www.country.com.my slash open account, open dash account dash form so they can sign up a Kananga uh, share trading account because uh, you can't find a, a lot of uh, you know gold mining companies, silver mining companies in Malaysia, but you know if you go to the foreign market, then you'll be able to assess uh, to go into this industry and uh, see how this industry outperformed the S&P over the past five years. So you can go to uh, open an account with Kananga uh, so that you can it will enable you to assess the overseas market. So for our next webinar, you'll be conducted in the uh, Mandarin. So it is called uh, 2020 uh, Next Half Year Outlook, uh, 2020 Xia Ban Nian Zhang Wang. Okay, it will be conducted in Mandarin session. So it is happening on 23rd of July, 2020, 8.30 to 9.45. So I have also put in the registration link in the uh, Q&A box so you can click the link to register so that uh, you'll be kept in the loop of the next webinar. You will be uh, have a better idea hearing from our speaker what is the outlook for the second half of 2020. So the session will be in Mandarin. So thank you very much, uh, Kananga, for bringing to us this webinar. Thank you, PC, for sharing your invaluable uh, insight into this money industry. I think all of us here have gained uh, enormously on how we can uh, look into this uh, mining industry and protect our wealth uh, through uh, through some exposure in gold and silver. All right, with that, uh, thank you everybody for tuning in to this webinar brought to you by uh, Kananga. So I will see you all in the next webinar. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.